where you can ask Judy questions. Person. Um, our very special guest this evening is uh, Judy Feld Carr, and she will be talking about how she uh, rescued Jews from Syria over a period of 28 years. Now, this evening we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of having uh, Judy uh, tell her story, we will be showing you a film um, which actually um, summarizes um, what Judy did, what she has done. Um, and uh, this film was made by the Israel Broadcasting Authority. It's called Miss Judy. And it uh, was aired on Israel television in 2011. And it was the opening film at the Toronto Jewish Film Festival in 2012. Now, Judy was born in Montreal. She was raised in Sudbury, a small northern Ontario town. Uh, she's the daughter of a fur, fur trader. Uh, she's a very accomplished musicologist. She has several degrees. Uh, she was a lecturer, uh, a teacher, and um, for her work rescuing Jews from Syria, which you will be hearing about, uh, she received, or she was one of the first six recipients of the Presidential Award of Distinction of the State of Israel, and this she received in 2012, and was a member of the Order of Canada, and she has been given so many awards, there are really too many to mention at this time. So I would like to welcome you, Judy. Thank you for joining us. Uh, can't hear you. Can you hear me? Now yeah, we can, yeah. yes. Oh, good. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted that you're going to show the Israel movie uh, a documentary, and I am delighted to answer questions after to all your guests today. Okay, that's wonderful, Judy. So we'll just hand over to our technical expert, Lawrence, here, who will put the movie on now. Uh, it lasts about half an hour. And what made son and went back to Damascus mm -hmm. and the kid was crying in the backyard. He didn't know if he would see his son. A year later, he came back with another son and left me his son and went back to Syria. Oh. הפכה לארגון חשאי של אישה אחת. היא הודיעה מטורונטו, עקרת בית, אימא לשישה ילדים ומורה למוזיקה. הפעילה רשת של סוכנים מטעם עצמה כדי לחלץ יהודים מסוריה. אני יודע שהיא טוותה רשת של קשרים בסוריה. כיצד היא עשתה את זה, אינני יודע. מה שמחבר את ג'ודו, גורלם של יהודי סוריה, קורה בגלל ידיעה קטנה שמתפרסמת בג'רוזלם פוסט. ב-1972 ניסו 12 צעירים יהודים לברוח מסוריה. הם נהרגו בזה אחר זה. הסיפור מזעזע את ג'ודו, והיא מחפשת דרך לעזור לקהילה היהודית בסוריה. הם ובעלה הראשון פונים לשגרירות ישראל. I give up. Yellow. Yell a lot about what? Where are the Jews? Is there a rabbi? Is there a shul? Where, what is it? We had no knowledge. ליוותה אותם לאורך כל השנים. יהודים היו נרדפים על ידי מסתנים. היו רצים אחריהם, היו הולכים לבית הספר, רצים אחריהם, מיידים אבנים, 
מקללים, מגדפים, יורדים מלוכלכים, נבלות, וכל מיני דברים כאלו. החיים בסוריה היו חיים של בעצם פחד מתמיד, שבעצם היה חשש מתישהו, באיזושהי נקודה מסוימת, יכולים פתאום להציג לך. פתאום יכולים לקחת אותך ולהעלים אותך אפילו. יום אחד, באוגוסט 1974, נכנסו סלי קצב ובעלה זקי. הזמנות לחתונה של גיסתה, אווה ששון. פתאום שמענו שהיא בדלת, בא אבא שלי זיכרונו לבין חתונה את הדלת, ממני בא לי אמר לו להודות שבע שנה את הדלת. הלך לפתוח את הדלת, פתאום שמענו חלקה חזקה מאוד, ויצאנו ורצנו לסלון, וראינו אותו עושה כמה צעדים בנופל. קראו לפתוח את הדלת. ‫אמרתי את תשבח, ‫היא מאוד טובה תשבח. ‫-היא עד הסלון, ‫ואמר בערבית, הרגו אותי. ‫אבל היא הסבירה מאוד טוב, ‫והיא הסבירה מאוד טוב. ‫הרוצח התערב עם חבר בבית קפה, ‫שהוא יחסל את היהודי הראשון ‫שיקרא בדרכו. ‫היא יכולה לדבר. ‫היא החליטה שאי אפשר לסמוך ‫על המוסדות הרגילים. ‫היא יוצרת קשר עצמאי ‫עם הקהילה היהודית. ‫היא החליטה לקרוא מישהו בדמאסקס. ‫מי בדמאסקס? ‫לא. Maybe the whole thing was machine. What are we doing? We don't even know what we're doing. Come in, don't let me sit on it. No, I just want salad. Where's my cake? I don't even know. The operator in Damascus puts us through to a woman. To a woman in Damascus. We found out she wasn't home. And again, that's her. She wasn't home, but her husband was home. This woman worked for the Muhabarat, a Jewish woman who worked for the secret police. Her husband was home, and I swear we have given this man a heart attack. He gave us the name of the rabbi, the name of the school, the phone number of the school, and the lines went dead. Judy sent me a letter to write the rabbi of the Kiel of Damascus. She asked how to help her. She played her. She played her. calls me up and says, I have a telegram for you from Damascus. Oh my God, I said, read it to me on the phone. And she reads it to me. The rabbi sent the first shopping list of books. We need the following books in Damascus. And he signed it. And that was the first contact into Syria. since 1948. אז הוא אמר לו, אתה מרגל, לקח אותו כמה ימים, אולי שבועות, לביצוע. בזמן שהמשטר בסוריה רודף את היהודים, ג'ודי אוספת כספים מחבריה בקנדה. היא קונה ספרי קודש ושולחת דואר לסוריה. הקשר עם ג'ודי היה למעשה דרך מכתבים. אבא לקח סיכון מאוד גדול בעצם במעשה הזה, כי ברור שמבחינת הסורים, כל יצירת קשר חשאי עם מישהו מבחוץ זה פשוט סכנת מוות. I was only sending religious books. I wasn't thinking about getting people out. מה ששינה לגמרי את דרכה של ג'ודי, ובהמשך את חייה בכלל, הוא מכתב שכתבו שלושה רבנים מהעיר חלם. אזרחית קנדית שביקרה בסוריה, מסרה לה אותו אישית. They said something and I never ever dreamt I was going to get. Please get us out of Syria. Our children are your children. Don't forget, we're all Jews. Our children are also your children. ג'ודי שלחה מכתבים ליהודים נוספים בסוריה. אחד מהם היה משה ששון. המכתבים שעברו ביניהם היו מכתבים מוצפנים, 
שרק הוא והיא ידעו בעצם מה כתוב בהם. ומי שהיה קורא אותם מבחוץ, לא היה מבין על מה מדובר, הוא היה חושב שזה איזושהי סתם התכתבות בין חברים. תחת אדמה והחושך, כל היום וכל הלילה, אני לא יודע, הלילה מהיום באמת, אלא הם יבואו ויגידו סבח אחר, ואני בוקר טוב, אני אדע כי עכשיו בוקר. שלמה סווייד חי בפשטות בדמשק. הוא כבר היה נשוי ואבא לשבעה ילדים, עד שב-1984 הפך לגיבור של סיפור טראגי. מה שיקרה לו לימים יהיה אחת הסיבות שישפיעו על יחסו של חאפז אל-אסד ליהודים בסוריה. ב-1986, שלמה ושרה סווייד מדמשק מקבלים אישור יציאה לטיול באירופה. ילדיהם נשארים ערבון לחזרתם לסוריה. שלמה מסתכן ובא וחשאי לביקור בישראל. כאן הוא פוגש את שתי אחיותיו, שאותן לא ראה ארבעים שנה. כשהם נסעו בחזרה, אז הוא אמר, את יודעת, לא אכפת לי עכשיו למות. אני ראיתי את ירושלים, לא ראיתי את, 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 את כולכם. אני אמרתי לו, אל תדבר, ככה יהיה בסדר, אולי יום אחד ניפגש. וחזרו והגיעו בשלום. חצי שנה אחר כך מגיע אלי סווייד. האח הצעיר ביותר במשפחה, גם הוא לבקר את אחותו, שברחה מסוריה הרבה לפני שנולד. אחרי הביקור בישראל, הוא יוצא לאיטליה כדי לקחת משם טיסה לדמשק. הגיע לאיטליה, נדברנו שהוא יתקשר אלינו. לא התקשר, התקשרנו אנחנו, אז הוא אמר שיש מישהו שהציע לו מלון קרוב בבית התעופה, למלון קוראים מורגנה, והוא החליט ללכת על זה. אז הוא היה שם. ואז כשהיה צריך לחזור, צלצלנו לו בשבת בבוקר, אמרו, אנחנו לא יודעים איפה. הלך. המלון אמר, אנחנו לא יודעים, והרגשנו שזה שקר. לאה דואגת לאחיה אלי. היא מתקשרת לביטחון של שגרירות ישראל ברומא. אז כשאמרתי לביטחון, תשאלו על, על, על מלון מורגנה. אז הם צלצלו, אומרים, אין מלון, אין מורגנה, זה הכל פאטה מורגנה. אחיך לא יודעים איפה הוא. שבועיים אחרי העלמו של אלי סווייד באיטליה, הוא הועלם גם אחיו שלמה. בסוף יום העבודה המתינו ליד בית המרקחת המשפחתי אנשי המודיעין הסורי ודרשו ממנו להיכנס לרכבם. במשך חצי שנה לאיש לא היה מושג לאן נעלם שלמה סווייד. הייתי בבית מרקחת, באו אליי ולקחו אותי שני מחברת סוריה, תפסו אותי ונסעו אותי בווטסווגן. had seven children. Nobody ever saw him. And uh, nobody knew where they were. Nobody knew if they were dead or alive. האחים סווידו עלמו, אל גורלם נשוב בהמשך. רבי דהב had been beaten up very badly every time three of his children had escaped to Lebanon. And then רבי דהב ended up having um, uh, cancer. And 
he was really very sick. He didn't have a long time to live. I found out that they weren't gonna let him go without money. I had met a family already from Aleppo who came to Toronto to visit me. They told me everything about Aleppo. Everything about these secret police, about the buying of people. Through them, I started to set up what was an underground to be able to transfer money into Syria to pay off for this rabbi to come out. The Syrians took the money and took the money to the rabbi in 1978 and took the money to Canada. He was killed in the hospital of Arsinae in Toronto. I went to see him and he said to me, Judy, I'm go- the doctors knew he was going to die. He said, but I don't want to die here. Everybody's wonderful, but I want to die in Jerusalem. But I have a mother who's 97 years old. I haven't seen her since 1948. Do you think you could send me to Israel to see my mother before I have a cup of coffee with my mother? הרב אליהו דאב נקבר בתל אביב. כעבור שנה הוציאה ג'ודי מסוריה גם את בנותיו. אחת מהן חיה כיום בישראל. קהילות יהודיות בארצות הברית, כולם עסקו בנושא הזה, לכולם היו ועדות בנושא הזה, אבל אף אחד לא הרחיק לכת עד כדי טיפול אינדיבידואלי באנשים שרצו לצאת או רצו לברוח. האחים סווייד עוברים מינויים קשים בכלא הסורי. החוקר הוא אמי, היה החוקר דוסי, מערה הדרוזים, טורקי על המדים, אחר כך ידעתי השם שלו, והיה אכזב, אכזב מאוד. או שבו אותי ברגל לאוטובה צבאית, תגיד נדמה אתה מכיר אלי כהן, אתה הכל. אתה מרגל, התחיל. ותן לי מכות, פה ופה ופה. חשמל גם, מכות, מכות חשמל וסלקות. They, they took out all the fillings from his teeth because they said, uh, the torture said that if he, that fillings, he would be sending messages to Israel through those fillings. I Gestapo, like the Gestapo SS of Germany. כמו הגסטרו של גרמניה הוא היה, עד אכזר מאוד. אני השתדלתי להתאבד, ולקחתי השעון, והיה הבורגי שלה, עשיתי... וירד דם. לקחו אותי לבית, לבית החולים. הסורים לא אפשרו לשלמה להתאבד. כמעט חמש שנים היו אחים סווייד בצינוק, בלי לראות אור יום. היה לי שבע ילדים, אני לא יודע מה המושג שלהם. איפה הם? הם תפסו אותם גם? או אני רב, אני רב. הגיע לבית שלנו מכתב מקנדה, מן אחד קוראים לה ג'ודי. והיא אמרה לי, אני יודעת שיש לך בעיה, אנחנו איתכם ואנחנו נעזור לכם, אל תדאגו והכל יהיה בסדר. And she used to go from prison to prison to prison, taking her jewelry 
I'll give you this jewelry if you let me see my husband and my brother-in-law. And they said, they're not here. We don't know anything about them. This went on and on. I met with the president of Amnesty International in Canada, and I said, um, you are doing nothing for Jews. You're doing for everybody else in this world, but I don't see Jews. I bought their book. And I read the book from cover to cover. I don't see one Jewish prisoner in this book. Why is that? Is it because they're Jews? What is this, uh, anti-Semitic? Oh, well, this is guilt, right? You tell me where those two men are. About six weeks later, I get a letter that the Syrians have told them where the two men are and that they're in prison. And I have the name of the prison. לילה קר, מגיעה כל המשפחה לגבול סוריה, טורקיה. מאוד רצינו לברוח, הרבה הרבה שנים אנחנו מדברים על זה, עד שיצא וברחנו, ביום חמישי בלילה, בערב, האח שלי שבר את ה... קודם כל את המנורה ברחוב, שיוצא בלילה שאף אחד לא ירגיש. אני ואחותי ואימא שלי והאחיות שלי רווקות, ואח שלי כולם ביחד. כדי להיות בטוחים שזו אינה מלכודת, הביאה משפחת ששון חצי שטר כסף, שהיה חייב להתאים לחצי השטר שהיא בידי המבריח. כל דרך ברגל. אני הייתי בהיריון בעיר החמישי, ולא סיפרתי למבריח שלי בהיריון. אם הייתי אומרת לא, לא היא נותנת לנו לצאת. וכל הדרך עלינו הרים, ירדנו, נפלנו, היה ממש פחד. וילדים קטנים, זה בוכה, ובעלי זכרון הברכה היה נותן להם משהו שתהיה כמו שירדמו. למה המבריח, הוא אמר לנו, מישהו בוכה. הבת של אחותי הייתה בת שנה, התחילה לבכות, הוא אמר, אם תמשיך לבכות, אני אוריק אותה. הבן שלי זה שי, ועוד בדרך מהגשרי והקור. קיבל דלקת באוזניים, ועד עכשיו הוא סובל מהאוזן, מהבריכה. ניסו לעבור את הגבול לסוריה, לטורקיה, היינו על הגשר, יש המשטרה הטורקית הולכת ובאה, אנחנו מחכים שילכו לישון. באותו רגע שמו רעש של ילדים בוכים, משהו כאלה מהילדים בוכים קטנים, רעבים, אז תחו לראות. מתחת לעץ, כולם מתחת לעץ, אם שמו את כולי ידיים ככה, שהם יקבלו איזה כדור. I didn't like to deal with smuggling at all. First of all, it was too dangerous, and what if they were caught? I would, my preference, and I can't say this was legal, because how is it legal to buy another human being? Legal, it's not. But it was easier to buy somebody or ransom somebody than to put somebody on an escape route, and what if they were caught? We got to the border of Turkey. The Mavriah had given us the border, and we all went after the other. We all went after the other. My daughter was a little girl, and she was a little girl. כל הרגליים של הסרטור, דם ירד לה מהרגליים. זה היה ממש, זה משהו עוד שהגענו. יהודי למעשה ליוותה את כל תהליך הבריחה, מההתחלה ועד הסוף, עד שמההתחלה, מבחירת המבריחים, ממהלך הבריחה עד ההגעה לטורקיה ועד להגעה לישראל. נדמה לי שהילדותה גם חישלה אותה. כי מי שהיה באותו אזור יודע, בעיקר באותם ימים שבהם, בימי ילדותה, יודע שזה היה מקום קשה לחיות בו, ובעיקר לגדול בו כילדה, ילדה צעירה. 
שם יהודי גדלה בערבות הקפואות של צפון אונטריו. אביה היה סוחר פרוות וצייד. מדי פעם בפעם היה לוקח את ביתו למסעות הציד שלו. כשבגרה ועזבה את הבית, סיכם ברגע של כנות את מורשתו. I've taught you everything you know how to survive. You can paddle a canoe like an Indian. You can shoot a gun. You can um, fish. You can swear. You can hold your liquor. And you're a good Jew. Six things. The most difficult part of Judy is the most difficult part of Swayed. שישבו בצינוק הסורי. התחילו יותר לדבר עליהם, התחילו להופיע כל מיני כתבות כאלה קטנות בעיתונים. ארבע שנים מאז אותו הערב שבו נעלם בעלה, הותר לשרה ולביתם לבקר אותו בכלא. שרה לא מזהה את בעלה. הלכנו ככה, ואני לא ראיתי איפה בעלי. אני מסתכלת על זה, על פנים, ואני לא רואה איפה הוא. בת שלי, היא הסתכלה טוב טוב על איזה איש היה שם, ואמרה לי, אבא, אבא, הנה אבא. אמרתי לה, מה, מי זה אבא? זה אבא היה אחד עם זקן ככה, עם השיער שלו לפה, וריח שלו... ריח מסרי, לא, לא יכולים ל, לראות אותו או ל, לדבר איתו. אמרתי לה, מה, זה אבא? אמרה לי, כן, כן, זה אבא. כדי להרגיע את הלחץ הבינלאומי, ערכו הסורי משפט זריז לאחים סווייד. תוך חמש דקות גמרו את המשפט עם גזר הדין, עם הכול. עוד חמש וחצי שנים בבית סוהר. אני קראתי את זה בעיתון. זה הופיע למחרת בעיתון. אני הייתי המומה לגמרי. יום אחד uh, הגיעה אליי ג'ודי למשרד והוציאה מתוך תיק uh, שנשאה ספר תנ״ך, ואמרה לי, אתה הראשון שרואה אותו בקנדה. מיד ראיתי שהוא עתיק יומין. מרגש, עד היום הוא מרגש אותי, כן. התנ״ך, שנכתב בימי הביניים באיטליה והגיע לדמשק, נחשב ליצירת מופת של אומנות יודאיקה. The story of the Jewish people. How much you pay for it? I didn't pay anything for it. I didn't buy it. It wasn't people. I smuggled it. I don't pay for smuggling. Only people did I pay for smuggling. This, nothing. Nothing. How I did it, it will never be known. זה לא יהיה הסיפור היחיד שלא ייחשף לעולם. לעולם לא נדע מי האנשים שפעלו במחתרת הסודית של ג'ודי בתוך סוריה, ואיך התנהל הקשר ביניהם. Somebody else thought they're the only ones, so they never talked. They, they, first of all, they were afraid to talk. Second of all, they didn't want anybody to know they were working with me. But you know what? The whole street was working with me. In the beginning, the United States was a country of Judy. 
הרעיון שיהודייה קנדית, אימא לשישה ילדים, מבריחה יהודים מסוריה לטורקיה, נשמע כמו פנטזיה. לאחר זמן, החל את ג'ודי והמוסד לשתף פעולה. לא עשו לה בעיות, אבל אני חושב שבתחילה זה היה מוזר להם, כמו שזה מוזר היה לך, שהיא עובדת לגמרי לבד, והיא עושה מה שהיא מחליטה. ולכן היו קצת צעירים כלפיה. אבל הרגישו שהמידע שהיא מעבירה הוא מהימן ומועיל, וכך מעת לעת גם העבירו לה איזה עצה או מידע, אבל לעיתים די רחוקות, כי נזהרו איתה. היא הייתה זהירה יותר מכולם. had problems with me, because after all, I'm a housewife. I mean, so they thought. And, and I think it was very difficult for them to comprehend, to understand that I wasn't trained in foreign intrigue, but I could figure it out. משפחת נחום החליטה לברוח מסוריה. הוחלט שמשה ואחד מהילדים יצאו מהמדינה כחוק, כי אם ייתפס מישהו בבריחה, עדיף שזאת תהיה אישה. אותה יענו פחות בכלא. החלטנו שהוא, ברגע שהוא ייסע בבוקר, אני יום אחד לא נשארת לבד עם הילדים בסוריה. פחדתי נורא. לקראת ליל הבריחה עומדת לפניהם החלטה גורלית. מי משני התאומים יסכן את חייו ויברח עם אימא? הגשנו בקשה, אישור יציאה לשני, לתאומים שלנו, לא נתנו, נתנו לילד אחד. אז בחרנו, הילד היותר יותר חזק כביכול, ויותר קשור אליי, השארנו אותו איתי. וג'ודי <אז> שילמה את כל ההוצאות, אנחנו לא שילמנו למבריח שום דבר. אני שמתי רעה על התנים, צריך להיראות כמו מוסלמי, ככה שלא יתעורר שום חשב. והתחלנו למעשה, עם רדת החשיכה, וזה בלילה בלי ירח, התחלנו את המסע. שם המסלול, הם כמו גששים, מכירים את נתיב הבריחה עד הגבול הטורקי. היינו אמורים כל פעם לקחת, אסור לנו לדבר בדרך, וזה חושך ואפלה, ואף אחד לא רואים... מחצי מטר, לא במטר אחד את השני, אני תפסתי את הידיים ש... של הילדים, וכל הזמן ילדים שאלו, מתי נגיע? ופחדתי לה... להגיד להם, לאן הולכים? שאלו, לאן אנחנו הולכים? אמרתי להם, לסבתא בדמשק, כדי שלא י... שחלילה יתפסו אותנו, לא, יג... לא יגלו, יספרו שאנחנו הולכים לישראל. הגענו עד גדר טייל, וזה הקטע הכי, בהחלט, מכל הבריחה הכי חרוט בלב שלי, בלב ובזיכרון, היה גדר טייל, שזה המבריח הוריד אותו, כדי שאנחנו נחצה, וזה בדיוק ככה נזכרתי בניצולי שואה. ובדיוק הרגשתי גם שאני ניצולה. נסענו באוטו הזה עד שבדרך ראיתי. כבר התחלתי לראות שלטים כתוב בטורקית, רק אז האמנתי שסוריה מאחוריי, ואנחנו אה, מתחילים עידן חדש בחיים שלנו, החדשים. Sometimes parents had five children, and I could sometimes buy two. And they had to give up their children to somebody they didn't know. And they didn't know. They never saw me. Nobody ever saw me. I was the best kept secret in the Jewish world. I decided I have to get them out of prison. And I told it to somebody in the Mossad that maybe... I would get them out of prison. He said, you'll never be able to do it. They wouldn't have survived another two weeks, I'm telling you. Another month. I don't think they could have survived. 
So what I decided to do was try to pay off everybody, the judges, the lawyers. As a lawyer, it's very difficult to come home one night and find your wife standing there. And as you come in, she says to me, Don, how do you bribe a judge? I said, I beg your pardon. The Suede brothers were released from prison, and in the case of travel, all members of the Syrian Jewish community will now be accorded the same rights as those afforded to all other Syrian citizens. <laughs> I got a call on my private line from Damascus, from the party that was taking place in the Damascus ghetto. And the Swedes came on the phone and said, Thank you, Judy. Thank you. They don't know very much English. Thank you, Judy. And I could hear the music. I could hear the singing. There was such a party in Damascus that night. <laughs> אני לא כל כך רוצה לדבר על המצב שלהם, אבל הם השתנו. משפחת סווייד עלתה לישראל שנתיים אחרי השחרור מהכלא. הם מתגוררים ברחוב אלי כהן, בעיר בת ים. כבר יש להם תשעה נכדים. לשתיים מהם קוראים ג'ודי. Now what did you do? Oh my God, that's so beautiful. It's silver, silver. Oh, okay. עדיין יש בעולם לפרור, כמו... המשפחה האחרונה שחילצה ג'ודי מסוריה הגיעה למערב במקרה ב-11 בספטמבר 2001, יום אסון מטלי התאומים. סיפורה התפרסם כאשר הוא הוענק לאות מסדר קנדה, עיטור הכבוד הגבוה ביותר במדינה. אבל בישראל שמעו מעטים את סיפורה של עקרת הבית היהודייה, שלימדה מוזיקה קלאסית ביום, ובלילה חילצה אלפי יהודים. Well, that was quite an amazing film. How did, how, how do you feel, Judy, when you, when you see that film? How, how do you feel? The film was incredible. I can't hear you. The only thing that's Just bothering sick. me is that the people... Can you hear me? She's on mute. She's on mute. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Judy, can you say it again? Judy, we can't hear you. Judy, 
You have to unmute me. Yes. You have to. Yeah. Okay. There we go. You can hear me now, now. we can hear you. Now we can hear you. It's Start wonderful. from the beginning. Yeah. It's wonderful <laughs> to meet all these people by uh, Zoom. But what I'm sorry about is that the film kind of got destroyed on the way. It did a, it was a lot of research done by the Israel Film Board. And it's a good piece and it's 100% accurate. Yes. But you say it was destroyed. You mean? Well, no, the, just the wording because we missed out on yeah. a lot of the words that the people had said. Right. And really, there was a lot in the show. Yes, yes. They and, suffered yeah. a lot. Yeah, they suffered a lot. Um, you, you, your, your work has been said to be the best kept secret. Um, and even the Mossad didn't know what you were doing. And initially, they were suspicious of you. Um, how did you come to end up um, breaking, breaking down that suspicion and working with them? You can understand the Mossad's attitude. I am a lay person sitting in Canada, but I was taking these people out. I was running an escape and I was doing ransoming. So it came to pass that they realized, hey, I'm not so bad after all. And we started to work together, but as one of the ministers said in the film, they worked with me in a lot of things and I worked with them, but I was not an agent of the Mossad, but we were very, very closely related in many, many parts of this. It's certainly, for me, it was important for them, to, for my protection, for my protection from them. Right. And how did you raise the money that went to uh, all, the, all the ransoming? We raised a tremendous amount of money here in Canada and through the United States through private funds. But we never advertised. We never had a dinner. We never had a party. We never had a fundraising because you have to understand, this was a totally secret operation. Everything went by word of mouth from the Beth Senate Congregation in Toronto, which is the largest synagogue in North America, which had a fund that was named in memory of my late husband. And the cards went, people bought cards uh, from different parts, from Vancouver to Newfoundland, we had donations coming in constantly by word of mouth. Nobody, nobody ever spoke where the money was going. We took no money from Israel, no money from UJA. This was all private domain donations from ordinary people. <laughs> and that money went immediately with no overhead, into whatever deal was able to be done at that time. Right. And what would have happened had the secret got out? What would have happened, do you think? What would have happened if? Had, had it, it no longer remained secret, your work? I mean, what, what would have happened had it leaked out, what you were doing? But it never happened. Yes. It absolutely never happened. It couldn't possibly happen because I was the only one who knew what I was doing. Right. And I never told. I had a speaker's bureau who went out and gave speeches on human rights in Syria through Canadian Jewish Congress, all human rights. But the rescue itself, not ever, ever, ever was told. Not ever. My husband knew. My children knew things were going on, but nobody ever knew how I was doing it. Not anybody. That's why it was a secret. Don't yeah. tell it's a secret. <laughs> and, and how 
How did you manage? I didn't really have to speak Arabic. I have fingers. I have hands. I. So I don't pay ten thousand dollars. I, I used to negotiate like you would negotiate in the shoot. And it depended on the person. Look, I have to tell you, I paid more for young women who were beautiful. And this was how disgusting the whole thing was. You have to understand, you're dealing with somebody's life. And if I used to have to think it's my own child that I was taking out of that country. I didn't play games. I was very careful. People wanted to leave very quickly, but please understand, they had to find me first. They had no idea where I was. They didn't see me. They had never seen me. They only knew the name, Mrs. Judy from Canada. That's all they had to hear. And they would hear a code word, and then that's how they went out. Can you tell us a bit more about the coded messages? What codes did you use? Oh, I had a lot of codes. It depended on who the people were. There was a man in Damascus who knew that I loved gin. <laughs> he had, we, he secretly visited, we met each other in the States, secretly hidden away. That was a code. Chinese food was a code with one of the rabbis because my husband is a kosher Chinese cook on the side, mm -hmm. besides being a lawyer. And we used to have codes for spring rolls, egg rolls, spare ribs, chicken wings. I know it sounds insane, but we would ask, he would ask for 500 egg rolls. Now, <laughs> it sounds insane. Egg rolls? What? Mm -hmm. I knew that he was trying, that was going to be a cost of $500 for Bakshish to take that girl through the airport and out. And mm -hmm. everything, had, everything had a name. Everything had a word. Yes, yes. Gin, vodka, they all knew what I ate, what I drank yeah. in Syria. And those were the words we used for, for codes. But now it's martini. You like martini, is that so? Oh, I love martini. <laughs> Favorite drink in the world. It's a dry vodka martini. Uh, uh, Judy, can you tell us a bit about the terrible choices that families had to make? Uh, like when some of them, some of the children could get out, but not others. And perhaps you could refer to the very last operation that you did uh, in 2001. What happened there? Well, let me just go back to the, the, the choosing. I never asked anybody, and it has to be understood by your audience. I never, ever, ever, communicated with anyone in Syria. They had to find me, and I was very difficult. They, find, they found me through the presidents of Israel, through people in different countries, people who went to shul on Shabbat in Brooklyn, and Motzei Shabbat, they would say to the man next to them, I have a mother. Do you know somebody can take out my mother? Wait, I'll find Judy. I ha the worst thing that I ever, ever had to do was when a family wanted to get out and I could, and I didn't want to take children on escape routes. If they were caught and if they cried, it was the end. The family would be killed. So I used to like to ransom them and make a deal. I give you one example. I made a rescue of a man who had been in prison three times, his wife who was shot in the back, and four children. She came out first. 
the husband got on the plane paid for with the four children. The Syrian Muhabarat came on the plane and said, there's a Jew on this plane, choose two children. He chose the youngest one and the third one. And I'll tell you, it was the worst thing. It was like Sophie's choice. And it took me another year and a half, I got the other two. But there were children who were being separated from their parents, where parents had to decide. I could only get a certain amount of buying a ransoming of passports for that film, that family who came to me. And they had six, eight hours to choose which child would leave. It was Sophie's choice. They had to, it was like the Shoah where they had to choose children and throw them off the trains. Well, they were taking children and sending them to somebody that they didn't even know the, the last name, just the first name, and here, take my children. This was, this was horrible. It's the worst thing that even I as a mother could even envision that a parent had to do, but that was how it was done. And now you asked me about the last family. Yes. The last family I was supposed to take out a father and seven children right after Rosh Hashanah. That was the deal, straight ransom. He had been run yes. over by a car yes. and yes. broke his, his body. They ran him over and yes. he was in a body cast from his ankles up to his shoulders. And then, right at the last minute, oh, by the way, they believe that a resident or a student set his bones and said it deliberately wrong. <gasps> so when I got him out, straight ransom, three seats across for him, seven children and the, and the mother. And uh, when he came out, I had him put on a plane on Air Pakistan nonstop to New York because I knew I was going to get him into the Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn. The Syrians changed the flight. But for if you have an, a, an answer to this, the Syrians changed the plot, flight put him on a different flight. Instead of coming in after Rosh Hashanah, he came in the day of September the 11th, 2001, an hour before the Trade Center. I oh, wow. don't know why they changed it. He was on Royal Jordanian Airlines, and I don't know how it happened, but it was a miracle. miracle. And I think they deliberately did it, but that's fine. Gosh, and there was a happy ending for that family? Well, it was a long, long ending. He had, they had to break his bones all over again, reset the bones. He was in the hospital for six months, and he's had a very, had a very, very hard convalescence. Gosh. Very hard. What, what a story. Can you tell us a little bit about the um, ancient religious books you managed to get out? Through, over the years, I was trying to get out some of the books that would probably be destroyed in Syria. I took out from Aleppo about 150 books and the last Sefer Torah out of Aleppo. But I heard I heard because we were at the Israel Museum that there was a Damascus Keter. There's the great Aleppo Keter, which is in Israel, but only part of it is because part of it is missing. Yeah. And I heard about the Damascus, the Damascus Keter. And we were driving home from the uh, uh, National Museum and I said to my husband, wouldn't it be amazing if I could get it out? 
And he said, you know, everybody has a normal wife. <laughs> I have her. <laughs> so that afternoon, I called the second in command of the Mossad, Friday afternoon, who yelled at me and said, how dare you wake me up? Don't you know that everybody sleeps in Israel Friday afternoon? I happen to be in Jerusalem. And I said to him, is there a Keter? Is there a real Damascus Keter? And then he, his reaction to me was, and I quote, have you taken all the Jews out of Aleppo and Kamishli yet? Don't bother me. Let me go to sleep. And I said, I know there is one. I know there is one. And you've just told me. He said, don't even think about it. Do the Jews in Aleppo and Kamishli. That was in the end of July. In November, I had the Damascus Keter. I had it brought it, to, you saw that uh, Ambassador Shelleff had seen it. I brought it to him in Ottawa. I brought it back to Toronto. I kept it in my house for a year. It is now where it should be in the National Library of Jerusalem, kept properly with the proper um, uh, humidity, and there it will stay. And anybody who wants to go, goes to Israel, if planes are ever flying again in our lifetime, as <laughs> for Judy's Keter, it's beautiful. Yes. It's something just to hold in your hands and look at it. The book was written in 1180. Wow. And it is now in, it, where it should be in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, that's fantastic. I would just have a look at the chat box to see what uh, questions have been uh, put to you. I know there was someone asking about the book that was written. Um, is, is this the book by Harold Trope, Troper? Uh, yes. What was it called? What is it called? There was a book written in Canada some years ago, the part that could be told. It's called The Rescuer, the yes. Rescuer by a professor at the University of Toronto called Harold Troper. Right. Uh, who is, was one of Canada's best historians. However, what is in the book is the part that could be said Good. at the time up to the year of 1999. Now yeah. there's a lot more that can be said. Right. Can you give us an example of what can be said that couldn't be said before? Well, it would be more about the escapes. The escapes are not in the book. There is reference to the escape routes. The escape routes are, are ter were so terrible. And it's better not to put them into print, who right. I used for smuggling and people like that. Right. <laughs> now, Toby asks, uh, Judy, how many people did you rescue in total? <laughs> Excuse me. Well, according to the Foreign Ministry of Israel and the Mossad, the total was 3,228 total over 28 years, one at a time. And now they have generations. Mm. Now there's second and third generations. Yeah. Some of them are great grandparents, grandparents and yeah. a lot of them named their children Judy. Well, to you. Yes, That's isn't that wonderful? Really <laughs> lovely. Absolutely. Oh, the greatest gift in the world. Greatest gift. Michelle asks, uh, did any of the children um, who were separated <laughs> from their families uh, become reunited with them in the end? I'm sorry, became? Uh, reunited. Were they reunited with them? Everybody. Everybody. Every single person, every child that was separated from their parents all went to their parents. Every one of them, wherever I got them, they were reunited with the families completely. Fantastic. No, uh, Nobody was ever separated, eventually. Okay. Now, Henry Green asks about a gentleman called Tufik Kassab. Can you talk about your relationship with him and his role? Do you uh, know? Yes. Is, 
Tofik Hassan. How do I remember him? Tell me first. Tell me first what he did, and then I will tell you because remember I've got over three thousand people. Right. Well, I haven't any more information at the there moment. There was. I don't know if oh, I know. To write Tufi a bit. Kassab, Tufi Kassab went to New York. I believe he's uh, did an interview with um, a professor from Florida on his story, which is very interesting. And uh, I have a picture of two I think the, the, in one of my the, albums. The professor in question actually uh, asked the question. Yes, well, <laughs> he know. He should know so because he could, he I sent him all the people. information on Tufi Kassab, right. including right. the picture of Tufi Kassab at a wedding that I was at, one of the rare weddings that I was at in New York. <laughs> so he knows he knows quite, quite a bit, bit about Tufi. Yeah. Okay then. Um, and another question from Sandra: What made you switch from Soviet Jewry campaigning to helping the Syrian Jews? I um, so Syrian. So, I'm sorry, Soviet Jews. When I was first married and, and a mummy and growing up and everything was the end thing to do. We all sent letters to Mrs. Sharansky and we did all kinds of uh, demonstrations. But that was a world, everybody in the world did it. In England, in Canada, the United States, all over. I read an article in the Jerusalem Post about 12 young men that tried to escape from Kamishli into Turkey and they walked on a minefield and the Syrian border guards watched them die. And to me, this was one of the most horrible things I had ever met, read about. So I went to the Jewish organizations in Canada, like Canadian Jewish Congress, and said, what are you doing about this terrible tragedy? Because everybody was dealing with Soviet jury. Mm -hmm. And they said, one of the men said, there's nothing you can do. Just stay out of it and don't do anything. So that's how it started. We formed a committee and started a little committee. But if you would have told me in those days when I was first sending religious books into Syria, which was the first communication we ever did, if you would have told me that I would end up taking people out I would tell you, you were completely mad. My whole idea was doing what the Soviet Jews, what we did with Soviet Jury. We tried to make a phone call. Never again did we ever make another phone call to Syria. My communication was totally underground. So there were no communications by phone call, nothing. And it became me in a sense because nobody here was interested in it. It was a secret. You're not supposed to talk about Syrian Jews. Okay, well, here's the challenge. But who would believe that what ended up? And I must tell you, I have never been inside Syria. I will never be inside Syria. I can never go inside Syria because of all the threats on my life. Not that I'm intending to go to Syria for a vacation <laughs> now, but uh, I kept everything completely secret and quiet. Yes, actually that ties in with another question to you, Judy. I uh, have lots of time. We're all uh, stuck here. We okay. can't go is out everybody anywhere. happy uh, to stay? You know, this is fascinating. So we can go on, perhaps. Um, um, uh, another question says, were you ever afraid there could be a danger to your life and the, and, or your family uh, while you were saving the Jews? And, and of course, you've answered that partly. But uh, are the Syrians still uh, aware of you? Are they still obsessed with you? Do they still threaten you? Uh, let me do the first part of the question. First <laughs> part is, yes, 
Unfortunately, mm -hmm. yes. I had threats on my life, threats on the lives of my family, and I am not, I won't tell you the threats because I don't need a, anybody to have any more ideas. The first threat was horrendous. The miracle that I'm still alive and my children are alive is a miracle. After that, yes, there were threats. There were articles in the Syrian press comparing me to Ellie Cohn, calling me a spy. Uh, uh, articles that uh, said that I worked with, that I set up a, um, a uh, situation with the prostitution trade in Syria, that I ran the drug trade in Syria. There were things like this, and for one, for a while, I had security. I did have security, especially if I ever went away to give a speech. I had security in front of my hotel rooms, security in the cars. I had security for many, many years. And unfortunately, that's the way it was. And it was, I can tell you, emotionally and physically, it was very, very difficult but yeah. it still kept going i people would send me a message please mrs judy i have a mother i have a child i have a sister and every time i and believe me i was going to quit all the way through this it mm -hmm. took uh, it took a toll on me emotionally to be playing with people's lives and making these decisions on my own Yep. But here I am, and there's nobody well, left in the country. <laughs> I didn't take them all. I must tell you, uh, the Israelis, the Mossad, took out many more than me. I just took 3,200. Right. And you say there's nobody left. There are three people that I know of that are left in Damascus, and no, I will not touch them. Right. Well, there are people who have told on us during our history, and uh, and we don't we don't deal with them. Right. Well, I don't deal with them. You are a woman of principle. I'm talking about people who told on other Jews to the secret police. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And. Um, Question from Frank Yellen. Can you tell us about the Judy Room? The Judy Room. Is uh, there a Judy we're Room? Sitting, we're sitting. <laughs> That's That's funny. Judy room. We're sitting in the Judy Room. It's not, it's my study. I have, well, I honors on the walls. I have, I have, um, the letter from Mr. Rabin saying thank you for taking them out and one day the story will be in history books. There's letters from Begin. I wish I could show you. I have walls of pictures. I had one, one thing that I asked Jews to do for me when they got out of Syria. Even though I do not keep in touch with anybody. I want a picture. I want a picture of you. Uh, and I have the pictures. I have filing cabinets full of every single thing I ever did because it was very important for me to write things down. I could never remember. I have an escape going and I'm doing a ransom of a kid. So I have so many things going in my mind at one time. And um, I used to write everything on pieces of paper. So all the files are here, everybody's story, written by hand, not on computers. I am computer Ill illiterate. I have everything on papers. But I'll show you one picture, which is beautiful. Yeah, show us one picture. I'll show you just one. Yeah. Can you see this? 
double Judy, it says. It's two little, two little girls, uh, one in Israel uh, that I got out and one in, um, one in Batyam and one in Brooklyn. Right. And they met at a wedding in, in Israel. And one said to the other, that's strange. They're both Syrian. You have a, your name is Judy? And my <laughs> name is Judy. Why is that? And they <laughs> did this double Judy. This is <laughs> one of my favorite pictures of all times. But I have pictures. Oh, give me a couple. Oh, let me show you. Um, no, this is not. There, here's a picture that was taken of the chief rabbi in Paris. But look in the background. There's two Syrian Jews. And okay. if you look at the eyes, yes. you know that those two men were in prison. The <laughs> eyes are black. They yeah. have no life in them. They are like... They're dead eyes. Yeah, yes, damaged by the experience. And there's no emotion. You have you look at unfeeling pieces of um, of glass. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Here, here's a picture of the ch if you can get it. The chief yep. rabbi of Syria. The first time he came hidden away in my house in 1980 when he was wearing in those days short sleeves. Now. <laughs> now he wears a black hat and a black uh, suit. Yes, it looks a bit different now. <laughs> but there's, uh, oh, Don, one more. Give me that little girl. One more? I'm going to show, I have so many. There's just in the frame. <laughs> this little girl. Yes. I took her out. She was born in a prison on a floor. Oh my Her goodness. mother gave birth on the floor in Aleppo. They wouldn't wow. allow her to go to a hospital. The child was going to die in the prison. Uh. I <laughs> sent in a fridge. I sent in a fridge. This is a crazy idea. I decided to send a fridge into Aleppo, into the prison, with bottles of Nestle, not bottles of milk, cans of Nestle's milk, because I don't trust the bottle. You can poison the bottle of milk. Yes, of I sent in cans of Nestle's milk. The woman gave birth by herself on a stone floor. She was able to feed the baby the milk, and uh, the baby is now a high officer in the Israeli army. Oh, wow, what a story. And I and have course, a yes. picture in Damascus with the little handwriting in Arabic on the back, but she was such a cute little kid. I don't know where she is because I said I, Somebody told me she's a high officer in Israel, but I don't keep in touch with anybody okay. I took out, except I have, I do keep in touch with the few prisoners that are left who haven't died. Anybody I took out of prison, I stayed in touch, in touch with, yes. Because That's, they need yeah. support. It's so terrible yes. for them. But you didn't want the others to feel kind of indebted to you, to feel that they had to well, what, yes, exactly, Lynn, because yes. what would happen is they would buy me presents. I don't mm -hmm. want presents. Get a life. You're out. You're free. You don't have to, you don't yes. have to buy me anything. Just have a life, have children, get married. That's it. I have gone at certain times um to a few weddings i have met people syrian jews in different countries when i had to do secret to get secret information from them but other than that that's no, it i don't uh, yeah. i i don't want them to have to buy me things give me something just have a life
Right. Well, you have all our admiration and, you know, there have been comments on the chat saying, you know, what a wonderful story, what, what, what a remarkable woman you are. And I, I just like, before we close, I just like to give the last word to your husband, Don. Can I ask him a question? Ask, ask him a question. Okay, you can ask him. You can ask me a question, I may not have an answer. I want to know, how does it feel to be married to Judy? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you get asked questions like, how do you bribe a judge? Uh, it's very difficult, but I'm proud, proud, proud of her. Everything that she's done, everything that she did here and in the community. And uh, I couldn't be married to a more beautiful and more important person. He's just saying it because he wants dinner tonight. <laughs> Everybody, there's a reason. And I want him to make me a martini. Uh, oh, yes, just really, a martini uh, would be good. <laughs> uh, John, I say for him, he had to live through all these things that were going on. My trips away from home, uh, the secrecy of my life, even my children lived through the secrecy and they knew, but they didn't know. An interesting thing that I must tell you to end, one when, when one of my sons got married, one of his friends said to me at the wedding, we knew your house, we're in an apartment now, we knew your house so well, why? We used to call your house the embassy. The reason being, we used to come into the house, they were all day school, Hebrew day school kids, the whole group of them, and they would come in and they'd go to the cupboards and there were lots of food, you know, six kids, they ate a lot. And, um, but they knew when the door closed in one room, there was no discussion, nor did any of them tell their, their friends what their friend's mother was doing. And you know, this is the most amazing thing in the Jewish world. Nobody talked. Absolutely nobody talked. Now you tell me that's not unheard of in the Jewish world. <laughs> it is unheard of, absolutely. It is. Yeah. No one talked because nobody really knew the story, sure. but it was kept very, very secret. And you know, and because of that, I sort of look at it and I say, I'm from the bush in northern Ontario. How does this come to Syria? But it shows us, shows us all, I guess, we're an amazing people. We truly, truly are an amazing people. How does somebody from the bush with the native Indians and the fur and the cold and the snow even remotely end up and a musicologist end up remotely dealing with Syria where I've never been. But I know the neshama of the people, the Jews from Syria. Well, I, I think they're some my, people are my, more, more remarkable than others. Some members of this people are more remarkable than others. Oh, and you yes. Some of them are incredible <laughs> others. Yeah, anyway, I, I'd, I'd oh, like... well, we've just had a late request, last minute request. Can you get a Mr. Bashir Assad out of Syria? <laughs> uh, Bashar Assad's uh, uncle has now uh, been charged with investment in Paris. So. No, we, we don't want to go there. It's okay. It's wonderful, wonderful to talk to you tonight. And I know it's been an amazing event. Thank you so much. Well, thank Judy. you for asking uh, me. No, we've been very privileged. Uh, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining us wherever you happen to be. And I uh, wish everybody a healthy Tubishvat. Yes, thank you. Tishvat. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just to, uh, just to oh, tell oh, everyone. Yes, yes, <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Don. All the very best to you. Thank and, you. And uh, we'll bye. just bye unmute bye. everybody, will we? Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. And bye. I hope bye. to see you again next week for another wonderful lockdown event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening from Jerusalem. Good evening, Ariel. <laughs>
Well done, yes. Judy. Oh, oh, thank, you, from Judy. thank you, Judy. You were great as always. We miss you. Yes, we will. Oh, hi, Bracha. Hi, hi dear. Welcome, people. I wish I were there. I wish we, we, we wish you were here. We miss you and Don so much. I miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great Judy, it's Shirley and Les. We love you. You are beyond amazing. Oh, thank you. You're